Hello and welcome to episode 427 of the Yellow World Pod. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund's 1-0 win against Hoffenheim, a 3-0 win in the Champions League against Copenhagen and we will discuss Marco Rose's return to the Bundesliga as Borussia Dortmund face him this Saturday away to RB Leipzig. And for all that and more, joins me the host of the excellent Gegenpressing podcast that covers the Bundesliga and the area manager of Transfermarkt in North America, Manuel Fed, hello Manuel, welcome to the show and uh, hey. to our YouTube videos. You came away from the camera now. <laughs> That's new. Last time I was on, it was just audio. So um, yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah, it's it's great to have you on. And uh, the reason why you are here is obviously uh, very much connected with the last point on the list, but obviously not exclusively because uh, you are very much uh, a verified Bundesliga expert and uh, because you are that, we can now start with the Friday night game. I know it's been a week. I hope you uh, vaguely remember the game. What happened on Friday? Uh, Borussia Dortmund <laughs> beat Hoffenheim 1-0. However, the result uh, was closer than the game because Borussia Dortmund mm. were utterly dominant throughout the 90 minutes. And uh, I do not recall many chances of Hoffenheim. I think Rütter had one chance from distance and that was about it. So, Manuel, uh, obviously there are a lot of things to discuss, so I don't want to dwell too much on this mm. game since uh, it's been a while, but nevertheless, uh, still an important win for Dortmund. Uh, the second clean sheet uh, after the 1-0 win against Hertha Berlin. What uh, were your takeaways from that one? Well, you know, it's it's for me, Dortmund have been such a... Um, such a weird team this year. Um, I mean, on the one hand, they've, they've been grinding out results, but on the other hand, Werder Bremen happened. Um, so it's I'm still trying to, the anti to get a read on them, if that makes sense, um, on where they are under Terzic, whether this is a progression of, a true progression on of what, what they were like under Marco Rose. Um, and I don't think we see the full potential of the squad yet for, for obvious reasons, you know, lots of injuries. Um, Sebastian Haller out um, with, with his testicular cancer. Um, he was at, he was at the game. He was at the game midweek, right? Which yeah. I think is a, is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of trying to find out what this Borussia Dortmund side really is. Um, is it this team that is going to get results every week and sort of manage to grind out results? Or is it, are these results um, an actual product of what Terzic wants this team to be like? Or is this still them just to come deal with a difficult circumstance? Um, and I think that's that's the fascinating story here. I mean, if they can continue this, the, the win is great. A 1-0 result, I think a lot of managers love that, right? Because it's like, it's a clean sheet. Uh, it shows stability. Um, it shows that the team has character. And um, I think the question really is how sustainable is it? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a question I'm going to ask multiple times today because uh, injuries are obviously a mm. key word for this game. For example, Rafael Guerrero wasn't feeling well, so Marius Wolf had to start on the left yeah. side. And uh, Bino Gittens obviously also started uh, on the left side uh, with Wolf, but uh, had to come off injured. Uh, because of a shoulder injury and now will miss for the, uh, I, I guess, first half of the season. Maybe not entirely because uh, mm -hmm. the World Cup sort of splits it up a little. Um, but for a majority of games uh, for, you know, the rest of the year, I don't know how long it will be exactly. But um, yeah, it is obviously not great news. Um, but uh, yeah, what really impressed me about Dortmund's performance against uh, Hoffenheim is that... Uh, they were uh, very compact, that they pressed Hoffenheim really well. And especially in the first half, Hoffenheim had very few answers. I think Andre Breitenreiter said after the game that they were too nervous in and without possession. And, uh, you know, the goal that uh, Marco Roy scored, I think in the 16th minute, it was, uh, was obviously really beautifully prepared <laughs> and assisted by uh, Julian Brandt, you know, just sort of dinked it into the box and uh, don't worry, mm -hmm. a bit lucky that Jude Bellingham didn't interfere because I think he was offside, but he didn't quite touch the ball. And then uh, Royce uh, yeah, pushed it over the line and uh, from there on, I think Dortmund really took control and, um, you know, they did not really let up. Obviously, what is interesting about the game in the final 20 minutes or so, um, Hoffenheim, I think, have recorded about 70% possession, Manuel. So uh, yeah. I, I think the, the fact that um, they did not create a shot 
uh, after the 60th minute really speaks to the stability that Dortmund had, although they uh, were not with the majority of possession, even though if you look at the numbers overall, I think it's exactly 50-50. Yeah, no, no, I think this is where maybe maybe where you see the progression, right? That the that defensive stability is is far better than because in the past um, Dortmund was always a little bit spursy, I guess <laughs> is, is, is the term that, yeah. that comes to mind, uh, giving away results. And we did see it this year with Bremen. Um, I think this is the this is the result that I always come back to because it does worry you that you know that your team kind of falls back into that. Um, I do mind want to add that in that Bremen game, I think Schlotterbeck played the last 10 minutes with an injury, um, which I think played a big role in, in that comeback. But I, th I think that the defensive stability was also the number one thing that they addressed this summer, right? Uh, Sule comes in, Schlotterbeck comes in, Özcan, who I actually think is, is a fantastic signing. Um, I think a signing that will help them a lot more than maybe even the center back signings you know he's he's a midfielder that, that gives them quite a bit and uh, probably the midfielder that they hoped Emil Shan would become yeah never did <laughs> <laughs> and um so yeah I think if if this is the norm and they can they can kind of stabilize this defensive stability that's how that's how you win right and this is not only how you win in the Bundesliga but it's also how you win uh, in the Champions League yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, we can just move over to the Champions League game, if you will, because um, mm. like I said, I don't want to talk too much about the Hoffenheim game. And uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to start on a very long monologue here now. But uh, Manuel, I have to say I was a bit in love with this game because um, I have not seen Borussia Dortmund play this well in a very long time for over mm. for the entire 90 minutes. Yeah. And you can say, OK, Copenhagen are maybe not the best team. But uh, I, I think you call them a potential banana peel on the Gegenpressing podcast, you know, where yeah. Dortmund must not slip up. And uh, they most certainly did not. Obviously, Copenhagen had a chance, uh, the biggest one right after the halftime, where uh, Alexander Meyer, who, of course, mm -hmm. had his debut, <laughs> making his Champions League debut before making his Bundesliga debut, um, had to come up big. But otherwise, they also did not have too many chances. And um, Dortmund really from the first minute to the last were very aggressive pressed in numbers and um, obviously it was you know if I'm raving here it was an excellent team performance but um, you know just to highlight how Julian Brandt and Rafael Guerrero who are often slated especially here on this podcast for lackluster to even lazy performances mm. really pressed their opponent hard uh, the 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 first chance that Dortmund created was a Julian Brandt chance because he was on the left side, even though he, he should have been on the right, but he was overloading the, the space and really putting pressure on the opponent. And, uh, you know, that that was uh, the help. And then the second chance Julian Brandt created by dribbling into the box on the right side and uh, crossing it over to Modest, I think it was. And uh, obviously the, you know, the first goal that Brandt um, sets up for Royce is just magic. Uh, and the the, the tunnel is where Guerrero, you know, bullies someone off the ball, which is something you just don't see often. And uh, to me, overall, my first takeaway is that Borussia Dortmund, if they play like this, um, are very easy on the eye. And uh, I don't care if, you know, they play against a weaker opponent or not, because the entire um, approach to the game uh, and the way they close it out and how they kept the pressure on Copenhagen throughout just thoroughly impressed me. And if this is Terstich's vision, then, uh, yeah, I'm very much here for that. Mm. So if yeah. I don't even have a question for you. I just said something to say. No, so. But you, 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 you put up, you, I mean, this is, a, this is, you raise some important points here because I think in the past, this would have been a game that they would have slipped up on. Right. Maybe, uh, you know, and then, then you find yourself in a situation in, in a Champions League group where, you're chasing um, and to get out of this group, you need six points against Copenhagen, you know, pure and simple. Yeah. yeah that's, that's like, that's the homework. Um, and, and, and they, they got it done and they got it done in a fashion that was very convincing, uh, which is not something we've seen in the past from them either, you know? And I think in that regard, this, this is an important result. Every win is important, of course, but this one, in the manner of it is very important and impressive 
And I think there's there's a lot of positives to take away from that then uh, to say, okay, look, um, yes, this is Copenhagen. This is not the, the the best of the best in the Champions League, but it's still where we need to get points. And you start with a 3-0 win until your Champions League campaign. A Champions League campaign that we have to add is going to be rapid this year, right? Because of the World Cup in November and December. You're essentially having, I think there's only one week until the World Cup where there is no Champions League week, which is the international break. We actually They actually managed to put an international break into <laughs> the schedule, believe it or not. Um, and that's, you know, so, so you don't really have much time to really... Um, prepare for any of this, so you have to you have to hit the ground running, and they did, and that's so very important. Yeah, uh, f- you know, especially hitting the ground running right now. This this entire season has been Marco yeah. Reus also, because um, he has been praised by Tesic a lot for uh, ending his vacation prematurely because he did pick up an injury when he was with the national team uh, for the Nations League games and. Uh, Tesic has said at uh, consecutive press conferences now how vital it is that he basically um, came back early mm. in order to be there with a new coaching staff and then lay the foundation in terms of fitness and everything else that uh, you know is now paying off for him and the entire team because I think he is uh, among the uh, hardest working players statistically uh, in, in terms of you know how much uh, meters you cover. Uh, in the Bundesliga, mm-hmm. and usually it's all uh, defensive midfielders, and then there's Marco Reus, who just uh, puts in one shift after another, and obviously scored uh, the one nil again. I think against Hoffenheim, he equaled the uh, record of Money Burgsmüller, who of course is a Dortmund mm-hmm. legend when it comes to scoring the opening goal. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if this was just domestic goals or international, but if it were international, also then uh, that's uh, now would uh, be his alone. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just fantastic to see how many players are hitting form. And on, on the other side, you know, you have all these injuries popping up. You know, I'm having this yeah. running gag on Twitter now with a surprise injury at uh, basically when the lineup sheet is <laughs> published. But this time it was Gregor Kobel, who is obviously a vital part of this team and uh, had to be replaced by Alexander Meyer and... Uh, Obviously, a very first good debut for him, but you j- just don't know how he's going to cope against uh, opponents that will, uh, you know, have more shots on target. Let's put it this way. But, um, you know, the fact that uh, even though you had have all these injuries, uh, you still managed to rest uh, Hummels and, uh, you know, mm. Zule, who had a lot of bad press. I think you covered that on the Game Pressing podcast too. Um, yeah. manages to, um, you know, have a very good performance and uh, show what he can do. I mean, if you look at the 1-0, um, it is him winning position and then making the run and drawing one defender away from Roy. So, so he has that 1v1 situation, which allows him then to score. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm personally really psyched about this performance. Obviously, we all know in this sport, things can sour very quickly, but... Uh, yep. In my heart, I will always have the Copenhagen win. <laughs> so, um, but uh, obviously, you have a more distant view on Borussia Dortmund. So, um, you know, what are your talking points uh, right now surrounding the black and yellows? Yeah, I think it, it, you, you could hear it on the top of the pod a little bit, or YouTube video, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it's just so early still to. to to draw your conclusions of what's going on. Um, I've been really critical of coaching appointments in general in the Bundesliga. Anyone who listens to a gegen pressing podcast knows that Stefan, this, this is a big talking point for Stefan in mind. This season is that we just don't feel inspired by any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're talking about another uninspiring appointment later on. So <laughs> here we are. But well. <laughs> um, I think Eden, Eden Tezic was in this job even last year in one way or another. Um, you know, he, he was kind of promoted to be his successor's boss. Uh, and we all knew that eventually he would become his successor's successor. Um, and then you have to, you have the circumstances of the injuries and, and you have the Haller situation, which is, is extremely difficult. So I, I want to cut, cut him in maybe some slack here, but I, I just, you know, we all we want in this league is a challenger for Bayern Munich. That's everyone wants that. Even I think even Bayern Munich fans want that. And 
I am yet to be convinced that him and the stop on side can do that. Um, I certainly don't think they can do it this year, but I am yet to be convinced that they maybe can do it next year, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, I mean, that remains to be seen how development really goes, because as you yeah. said, it's extremely early days. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just on the fence because I've, I've seen so many summers where Dortmund were crowned the transfer champion of the Bundesliga. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, at the end of the year, they just kind of tear it all up down again, they tear down the house and rebuild it. And, um, you know, I just maybe want to see some consistency. I want to see, um, some development. I want to see, and this, I think this is actually key. And it's really important and gets underestimated. I think for Bundesliga teams to get better and to actually make the league more difficult for Bayern, they have to do what Frankfurt do, did last year and have a deep run in Europe. Because I think this is, you know, how you A, you earn money, but B, this is also you, how you become a more attractive place to play at. Um, and I think this is so, that's something that I would like to see from Dortmund. I don't want them to necessarily see win a title, but I would like them to see have a really strong Champions League performance this year. Yeah, no, I totally I agree think, with you because monetarily, uh, you know, Dortmund have yeah. lost a lot of money also due to COVID and uh, mm -hmm. having a deep run would uh, help a lot. But um, yeah, also just in general, you know, just to make a statement that you are a bit of a more serious club yeah. because last year it was pathetic, embarrassing, all these words um, and, you know... That has been for a while, Stefan. Like, I mean, the European performances have been an issue for a while. Yeah, you really think I mean, about it. the, the quarterfinal run where Dortmund were, you know, eliminated by Man City and was very close. I think there was yeah. much shame in that. But overall, I, th I think you're right. Dortmund uh, definitely need to do better. I mean, uh, the fact that uh, Leipzig made it to the semifinals, uh, how many years ago? But Dortmund... Uh, Two and a half. Haven't, yeah, yeah. haven't yet since uh, their Champions League run uh, tells you a lot as well. So, um, yeah... It's uh, obviously a good start to the Champions League campaign. Uh, also ahead that Manchester City uh, battered Sevilla, who obviously are Dortmund's biggest rivals for the second spot mm. in that group, if we're being realistic. So um, I think Dortmund have to hope that Manchester City also take all six points away from Sevilla while maybe fumbling it somewhere, <laughs> maybe away from the Westfalen. I don't, I don't know how this is going to uh go but obviously I'm um, looking very much forward to the challenge that uh, will present Dortmund I think next Wednesday um, mm, but yeah. uh, since you are in the uh, North American hemisphere and so am I we cannot end this uh, uh, Copenhagen discussion without mentioning Gio Reyna of course who uh, mm. after Torgen Hazard went down after 23 minutes or so um, yeah I had to come on and play you know a very encouraging 70, mi uh, 70 yeah. minutes and uh, yeah what what did you make out of his uh, two assists performance I was going to ha yeah I was going to say two assists um, that was impressive you know what I found even more impressive was the, the f he was I mean the game was very physical and he was hacked to pieces he throughout was. and we know no I think every time he went down there was a collective gasp south of the border <laughs> um, because of his injury history but his body was stood all of it and I think that's almost the most positive news about about this game is that not only was he back and he played excellent but he also withstood a very physical game um, at the highest level and that was I think the question mark that we all had going into the season I know he was in Austin with his dad to train during the summer, right? Uh, to prepare his body, uh, spent a lot of time there. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that is really positive. And if he can stay stay fit, we all know what an important player he can be, right? And the, the role that the, the expectations there is in him in Dortmund, you know, to sort of take over the mantle of Marco Reus eventually. And um, yeah, for that, I thought this, this was a really, really, really positive not just performance, but game for him. Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah, I mean, Tessa just said how happy he was, you know, that was yeah. maybe the most important thing, just to see the joy back in Gio Reyna. And I must say, just uh, systematically, if you look at the Brand Reus and Reyna attack against Copenhagen, you know, even though Reyna hasn't played for mm -hmm. a long time, 
the amount of creativity oozing out of this midfield, also helped by Ashan and Bellingham, who both, I think, managed to play the ball quickly forward, which, of course, is important. Um, and, <laughs> of course, Rafael Giri was also a, a big uh, source of creativity. But uh, just sort of three alone up front, I, you know, I was really impressed because Dortmund right now are not really playing with a true winger, if you will. Obviously, mm. uh, Meunier had a lot of freedom, but um, th it's it's still very lethal because they can operate on very tight spaces and uh, overload the left or the right or the center and then uh, find one player making the run and uh, having mm. a cutback or something like that. And obviously, when um, uh, Reyna assisted the first goal, which was obviously the, the cutback to um, Guerrero, that, that is just an intelligent pass because Guerrero only had to sort of stick his foot out and the ball was in the net. And um, yeah, I, I wonder how this Dortmund side would look now with Sebastian Allaire because if you, you want to nitpick, uh, Anthony Modest obviously has not been superbly integrated. I mean, he mm. had his chances to score and so he has missed more than he scored. But uh, yeah. nevertheless, uh, you could uh, have a striker more integrated than he is currently. But um you know, maybe maybe he'll do better against Leipzig because uh, what I've seen overall from Dortmund uh, this mm. season is they have improved from game to game. Minus the Bremen game, I think that was their worst performance, but otherwise they have improved. Now, um, what I found interesting today at the news conference is that Terzic said um, that uh, Dortmund obviously showed a nice reaction to the criticism against Bremen, mm -hmm. but uh, now he wants to see how they react to the praise after the Copenhagen game and after the uh, Hoffenheim game. And uh, yeah, that obviously brings us nicely to the next opponent, which is RB Leipzig. And who are in quite a lot of hot water. They only have five points after uh, five match days and uh, sitting in 11th. And obviously the breaking news today is that uh, they not only fired Domenico Tedesco yesterday, but appointed mm -hmm. Marco Rose, as we predicted here on the Yellow Wall Pod. So Matthias and I can pat ourselves on the back. Um, <laughs> Manuel, please yeah. explain me this entire situation going on uh, at Leipzig. We also predicted it, I want to add. <laughs> Not me, Stefan did. Um, yeah, you, you know, looking back um, at Leipzig, remember that when Mike uh, Fairway from the De Telegraph reported that they came in with a bid for Eric Ten Hag mm -hmm. in May? And we all kind of said, well, why? And they, they have a good head coach. Um, I have done some digging uh, into this. And apparently, Leipzig have been unsure about Tedesco uh, and whether he is the right man to continue since the Rangers' performance in the Europa League semifinal. You could draw parallels. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is where, where I made the joke yesterday right on twitter saying like well if they are un unhappy with how tedesco performed against rangers in the europa league they marco Rose is maybe not their man <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> it was like that his side did much better against rangers but uh, i think it was the comments that he made um it was also i think there was there was some internal clashes on how he wanted the squad to be built and how leipzig wanted the squad to be built right he wanted a replacement for Paulsen. he wanted uh fewer midfielders in the squad, he wanted to, to thin out the squad a little bit. Uh, and instead, uh, a player was added in Schlager, who I actually think was a, was a clever signing by them. Um, nonetheless, it's not a signing that he wanted. Uh, he uh, wanted a striker not named Timo Werner. They gave him a striker in Benjamin Sestro, but he's not going to arrive until next year, right? Right. Um, and so there was a, there was some internal stuff going on with that which I actually think is, is, is fascinating. Um, and also then, of course, the fact that they were unsure about him already um, in May. Then, of course, uh, the Marco Rosa firing, or so do we say a mutual termination? Well, that's the well, thing. The conspiracy <laughs> theorists are saying that Rosa <laughs> maybe helped push himself out the door at Dortmund, uh, probably already eyeing another job in the Bundesliga. Because yeah. let's face it, Marco Rose is maybe, in some sense, what Edin Terzic is to Dortmund. He is to Leipzig because Leipzig is his hometown. 
Obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> Leipzig is not the Marco Rose's boyhood team because during his boyhood, <laughs> Leipzig did not exist. <laughs> However, But he started his entire coaching career there. Yes, yes, exactly. So he really went through the Red Bull ranks, if you will, right? So yeah. he is uh, he is Red Bull through and through in, in some ways and forms. And, uh, you know, Oliver Minslav today called him the perfect fit and... Uh, you know, called him being available, maybe even a, like a happy coincidence, if you will. Coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's just, it's, you know, Stefan, it's just funny how quickly this went. Yeah. We went from Tedesco fired, Rose already being in the town next well, day. Well, Rose said that they had contact on Saturday at the news conference. So yeah. this. So there you go. So Leipzig already asked about him before uh, the Champions League uh, loss against Shakhtar Donetsk. Yeah. So they would have done this anyways. No yeah. matter the Shakhtar Donetsk result, they would have done this. Um, and that makes sense. It would also explain some of the signings that they made because they probably fit Rose's style a bit better than they fit Tedesco's. I think there was a genuine hope that Tedesco would work out um, as a head coach there. Um I think there's there's some parallels to what happened at Schalke. Oh yeah, the undoubtedly. First, first year, where where he where he really stabilized the side and it did really well with a very mediocre Schalke team, and then um, really struggled to to put in creativity and you know develop the side. And um, we look at some of the the performances against the Frankfurt one is is, is the most mind boggling one, but the Schalke one too. The transition game was non-existent defensively, right? They, they, they were just sliced open. And yeah, they looked we like they were closing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, like, and I, I think the, the Leipzig board took a long, hard look at it and said, well, we can't wait 20 games like we did with Jesse. We have to do this now. There's the right man available. We have to do this now because, again, I mean, the Champions League campaign is really compact. We want to have a chance, and the chance is now small to get out of this group. We have to act now, and um, so they did. Yeah. Well, if I may add this from the uh, Dortmund perspective, is that what I find really, really cool um, is that Dortmund decided to part ways with Marco Rose uh, during the summer. You know, yeah. because uh, you know there was maybe a lack of confidence. You know, as I said, but they acted on that immediately because, as you say, Leipzig also were not 100% uh, confident in uh, Domenico Tedesco. Um, I think Mitzlaff uh, today at the news conference said that they saw the development creep in uh, at the back yeah. end of last season and they did not act on this. And now the problem is we all know the schedule, right? So <laughs> uh, they are going to be 13 games in 42 days after the international break for Dortmund, right? And mm. similar, it, it's going to be for Rosa. I don't know the exact day, but it's going to be a day every three, a, a game every three days. And uh, good luck with that is all I'm saying, because trying well, to yeah, integrate... They got Dortmund, they got twice Real Madrid, they got Gladbach. Yeah. Um, we went through the schedule yesterday on our part, and like, I don't have it completely in my head, but it's it's insane. It's it's, <laughs> it's bonkers, but it's bonkers for, for any European team is, is what I'm saying. So I'm right. just glad that Dortmund pulled the trigger when they pulled it because Rose now, uh, you know, he already struggled at Dortmund because he had an imperfect preseason there. And now he's like, mm -hmm. he, obviously he's not being presented as a caretaker manager. They want, uh, you know, I no, I heard, I know, heard the name Christian Streich name drop. They really hope this is going to be a long-term thing. And we obviously have a, a uh, listener question from Liam, you know, saying, do you think Rosa will be a good signing for Red Bull? And if so, how quickly? But uh, before you answer that, um, I'm just saying, I I think that it's going to be a struggle for, for Rosa. Yeah, it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, and, and you said earlier, uh, you were not inspired by this signing. So why not? It's um, Bundesliga coach gets fired, gets hi hired by another Bundesliga team. German guy, speaks German, available. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, it's 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 a special situation in, in Leipzig though, right? Is it though? I mean, I mean they this had is Jesse probably Marsh. the only club not Was named Bayern inspiring? that could... <laughs> yeah, but it's, this is the only club not named Bayern who could hire an international coach and get away with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you're right. So, um, 
I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but I still thought it was very interesting. And I, I still hope that uh, Leipzig struggle away because uh, I personally uh, think there's a benefit to the Bundesliga if Leipzig, you know, fail to make the Champions League, for example. Same goes for Leverkusen, if I'm uh, completely honest. But uh, in the meantime, obviously, it's going to be a difficult game for Dortmund because they are not only mm -hmm. facing their ex, but, um, you know, there are going to be Leipzig players with a new motivation because there's a new coach and they have to... Uh, you know, fight for their starting positions so they get their uh, starting premiums and whatnot. <laughs> uh, uh, very cynical of me to say that, but, uh, you know, it is a cynical club. Um, but, uh, yeah, in all honesty, what do you think is going to happen on, on Saturday between Dortmund and Leipzig? Wow. Uh, are we going to have a manager bounce is the question, right? Yeah. Um. I, I think that there's a lot of players that were um, unhappy with um, Tedesco at, at Leipzig. And it's going to be interesting to see how they respond to Marco Rosa coming in and whether they are going to be a bit fired up. Um, I doubt we're going to have to, we're going to see a defensive performance like we did against Schachter and Eintracht Frankfurt. So that's already going to make things a little bit more difficult for Dortmund. Um, on the other hand, this is a quick transition. Uh, we're going from what well, today's when today's Thursday, uh, so we have Thursday, Friday, or well, is today they might not even be able to practice. So we essentially just got Friday. Yeah. Um, it's a good time for Dortmund to play them. I hope so. I mean, may maybe it would have been a better time had Tedesco still been there. I would argue because the manager yeah, bounce can be. Gonna be is he going to be able to make those changes so quick? I don't know. Uh, Some, sometimes you, you just make a couple of adjustments, yeah. you know, breath of fresh air. Sometimes all a team like Leipzig needs because, let's face it, they still have a really good squad. And uh, Dortmund, um, you know, you talked at the beginning of uh, the show about sustainability. Now, obviously, yeah. I've been raving about their performance, their intensity against Copenhagen. But how long can they keep this up considering uh, they have seven injuries? Now, obviously, the... Um, there is hope that Adeyemi and Marlon can return, uh, but uh, it's uh, far from guaranteed because uh, it's still day to day for both of them, um, as Tessic said. And you know, as as much as I love Gio Reyna, it did not sound like he's going to uh, be a starter uh, on Saturday. And if he is, uh, I don't know how long he can play because obviously he just came back. He just played seventy yeah. minutes, so um, it would be quite uh, risky, if not uh, outright. <laughs> Uh, mm. Reckless is the word I was looking reckless. for. Reckless, yeah, that's, uh, that's to, a good word. <laughs> yeah, to to play him now. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't know how Dortmund will uh, play if they play with the same intensity, and especially if Dortmund play the same style mm. as they have done in the recent two games. I assume they will create a lot of counter attacking chances against Leipzig, and you just you know talked about their lack of transition, and um, obviously. I'm a little bit marred by Marco Rosa <laughs> because I know his weaknesses and I listened back to the Marco Rosa out episode and uh, one of them was that uh, I never really saw a clear identity with Rosa when he was at Dortmund. I think that's my main criticism. And today he said um, he wanted to, uh, you know, shore up the defense by putting more pressure on the ball um, and, and bringing that uh, Leipzig style back, if you will. But... Um, you know, if you can do that with two training sessions, I highly doubt. Well, all he needs to do is not play Marco Halstenberg. <laughs> Why? Is he so bad? <laughs> yeah, I thought he was terrible against Don Donetsk. I don't understand why you would pay 30 million euros for David Raum and then play Halstenberg instead. But that's, you know, what do I know? I'm not a Bundesliga head coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So, um, yeah. Obviously, I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, <laughs> Oshan and, and, and Bellingham go up against Schlager and Leimer, I think is their midfield, mm. right? Yeah. Because I think for a first time in a long time, I think that Dortmund has a better central midfield than Leipzig. Because the last time uh, Dortmund faced Leipzig, it did not go so well for uh, Dortmund. And I think, uh, you know, losing the central midfield was a big reason of that. So, um, yeah, obviously counter-attacking threat that Leipzig have with Werner and, uh, and Kunku and, uh, you mm. know, Raum obviously super quick too and Henrichs on the other side yeah. also, you know, it's it's still a very good team but uh, they do lack confidence so, yeah, I really hope 
uh, Dortmund indeed can build a 10-point gap because I think this is going to happen if Dortmund win on Saturday. I think as you name dropped me on the Gegenpressen podcast with this <laughs> remarkable set, which it is, because a 10-point yes. gap after six match days is already a lot to make up for. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. So do you do you have a scoreline prediction for me here? It's Dortmund at home, right? No, it's Leipzig at home. Oh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, I am going to make, I have to make a prediction for the game pressing prediction podcast. So whatever I say now, I have to stick with for that show too. <laughs> um, I'm, th I'm going to go with a 2-1 Dortmund win. All right, that was also my prediction. So I, I guess uh, we can leave it here, Manu. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to this game, but I'm also dreading it because I feel like if Dortmund drop points against Leipzig, as, as insane as this sounds, because Leipzig are such a good team right now, because they're in such turmoil, it, it would almost, mm. it, it would really hurt, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's just, uh, it, it was great to have you on. I'm... Uh, Really intrigued to see how things continue with Marco Rosa at, at Leipzig. I think everyone is uh, going to keep a very close eye on that. Uh, Manu, please tell our listeners where they can follow you on the internet. Yeah, just on Twitter, uh, at Manu Alvef. Um, I work for Transfermarkt, as you said, at the top of the show. We have the Gegenpressing newsletter with uh, me and uh, Stefan Biankowski, uh, where, we, where we bring you fresh Bundesliga content um, five times a week, three podcasts, two uh, one newsletter each um so you can follow that as well and yeah that's about it yeah thank you so much for coming on uh also yeah subscribe to the gig pressing podcast it's really great also subscribe to our youtube channel the yellow wall or type in b4b updates to catch the b4b update which i'm still producing almost daily and uh yeah otherwise follow us on twitter at yellow wall pod and uh, yeah that is for this week we shall be back with a preview episode for the man city game uh, as always, thank you for listening or watching. Goodbye.